There you have it. North Carolina A&T is in the win column for the first time in 2022, and they can thank the legs and hands of Ashaw Tootin. Oh, yeah. It's Locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked on HBCU podcast, your number one. Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked on podcast network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day and listen just because the mic cuts off because unfortunately for us it will cut off it doesn't mean it's time to end your journey it just means it's time to follow me on twitter at south exclusives and i would like to thank linkedin for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the locked on college network linkedin jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions do apply now when you're looking at this game it is very clearly or very clear why north carolina ANC was able to win this game and this name is baseball tootin it was tootin's show on saturday and he was the reason that they were able to overcome not a tad bit a medium a bit right a medium bit amount of adversity on the season to be honest we're gonna wrap up this game all episode I actually had a war in my mind on how much do I want to talk ANC versus South Carolina State at first I was like okay I typically do two segments for you know each game of the week on Monday but I was like man I just want to put it into one because it was so much that I kind of wanted to put into one, but I decided to expand it. So we're going to talk, start off talking about the run game and the pivotal matchup of the week and why I thought its outcome was kind of an example of why the outcome of the game was the way it was. And we'll continue breaking down until the episode is over. But let's look on that pivotal matchup. And that pivotal matchup was Bayshaw Tootin versus the South Carolina State linebackers, which were uh, BJ Davis and Aaron Smith. And then also Kendrell Flowers, the running back for South Carolina State versus the North Carolina a t linebackers of Taekwon King and then also Jacob Roberts. I want to start off because we're not going to bury the lead. Shout out my guy B-Date, right? Because I remember he said that I was like, bury the lead. And ever since then, it's just stuck with me. Let's not bury the lead. Basho Tootin stole the show. Point blank, period. There's no other way to start off a conversation about North Carolina AT versus South Carolina State on this in this matchup specifically without talking about Basho Tootin. He was the star, the MVP. He was the man who had the engine going for the third week in a row. Mind you, he did this the first time versus North Dakota State. Then he did it against Duke, which is an FCS powerhouse, and then an FBS team. And now he has done it against South Carolina State. In each game, he has ran for 120 or more yards, increasingly getting greater. So he started off in the, I think it was like right at 129 against North Dakota State. Then he had, I think, 133. And then in this game, he had 140 catches or 140 yards. I hope he didn't have 140 catches. Um, But he had 140 yards on only 12 carries well past 10 per attempt right so you're looking at 11 11 and a half ish per attempt this man was an absolute monster and he made a lot of progress on his legs or with his legs but he also had a big time receiving touchdown to go along with his two running touchdowns with one being on the first play of a drive that went for 38 yards so with his running game you had power running because he had a one yard touchdown you had explosive running and you also just had overall consistency throughout the duration of the game right and the running game was on all cylinders when it came to North Carolina a t because it wasn't just him. It was not just uh, Tootin. It was also Wesley Graves who was able to get some yardage on the, on the ground. So you have to give credit to that a t front line because we know it all starts with those guys up front. However, when it's multiple running backs who are getting 
good yardage on a consistent basis, it really showcases that, oh, this line is really getting some push, and they're able to really generate that run game. So I didn't want to highlight Tootin without talking about the offensive line. And I think it's funny how this game really made everybody turn around on a and People were really down on a and coming into this. They got blown out by North Dakota State. They lost to Duke. Um, they lost to Central in the first game of the year, even though it wasn't too bad. It was like 28-13. But it was overall not a victory. People were not high on A&T coming into this game. And since this victory, especially the way that it happened, I feel as if I've seen A&T in multiple ple- people's top five HBCU rankings. I can't wait until... Um, the HBCU Pro Sports Media rankings come out, and then also once the NCAA HBCU rankings come out, because then we'll actually know how some other people really feel. But I've seen multiple people put ANC back in their top five. I thought it was quite interesting, and you can really thank Tootin for it because he's been on a really good run, and it comes off of a strong freshman season for him with the Aggies. Now he is definitively the man. There's no more Jamey Martin in the injury situation. Tootin is definitely the man, and he is showing through the first four games that, you know what? I might not have done it against Central, but these next three games, and you can't say they weren't against quality opponents, I have ran this ball, you know? Um, but let's get into the South Carolina State defense. I thought B.J. Davis, though tooting is the talk of the town, I thought I thought Davis kind of had a good game. You know, he had 17 tackles. He was flying around. He was making hits on not only the running back, but then also the quarterback. And I th- I was really impressed with what I saw from him. I thought he looked really athletic. I thought he looked good sideline to sideline. And these are the type of things that you want in a new age linebacker. You got to make sure that you can go sideline to sideline. That's almost every linebacker has to have that ability. Now let's flip to the offensive side for the Bulldogs. The matchup was supposed to be Kendrell Flowers versus the North Carolina a t linebackers, but there was no Kendrell Flowers. And I believe that is the reason you saw the running game suffer so poorly, right? When you look at um, the leading running back for South Carolina State had 21 yards. I stress the ability to be two-dimensional on offense this week for South Carolina State. And unfortunately, the dimension I had the most trust in did not show up. And that's what I mean when I say I think this is how it showcases how the outcome comes out, right? Because they weren't able to run the ball, and you look what happens. Now... They lose, and they lose pretty badly. It wasn't really that close of a game, to be honest. I know the score at times felt like they could be in it, but truly I just didn't feel like they were. And the linebackers made the biggest play in coverage, and we're going to talk about that at the end of the matchup for North Carolina a and But let's just rattle off the run game by each quarter. For South Carolina State, you had five rushes for six yards, six rushes for one yard, seven rushes for 19 yards, and then four rushes for 14 yards. I will say that one thing I think made running the ball extremely difficult for the Bulldogs that was independent of any kind of injuries is the actual deficit they were facing. It's hard to run the ball when you're trying to battle back from an 18 point deficit. You feel like you need to pass. So now the play calling changes because the situation is different. And I think that independent of whoever was there. It's just harder to have success running the ball because even the leading rusher only had eight attempts for 21 yards, you know. So it wasn't effective, but it also wasn't many of them either. So that was definitely something. And when you look at North Carolina A&T, they had 15 rushes for 119 yards in the first quarter. Then you had 10 for 46, 8 for 88, 12 for 31. It's no coincidence that in the first quarter, in the third quarter, they were able to have the most success that they had all game long. However, in that third quarter, though they did not have as many rushing yards, they found a very nice balance of run and pass. So we're going to talk about the backup, backups, quarterback performance in this game because they got all the way down to their fourth string quarterback in this game. However, that third quarter was the best because they were able to pass the ball. Now, before I get into that, I have to. I would love, it is my pleasure to tell you about LinkedIn. In because for all of my small jobs or small businesses, we're in Halloween season. I'm looking for the pumpkins. It's about time that I get a pumpkin, get a jack-o'-lantern, right? It's about that time when we're talking about 
Halloween. And after that, you got Thanksgiving and Black Friday and Christmas. Small businesses need to be prepared. And the best place to prep yourself is by getting some good employees from LinkedIn. You can find the people who are going to fit exactly what you need. How many times have you sat across, and it's for my business only, you sit across from somebody and you're talking and you know they have no business here with your company. They do not align with what you're trying to do. Well, get to the candidates you want to talk to. You actually want to talk to <laughs> faster with LinkedIn. Just make sure you use the purple hashtag hiring frame. And listen, LinkedIn jobs can help you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. And did you know that nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? on a weekly basis so you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college that is linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free in terms and conditions do apply as we keep on rolling on today's episode of locked on hbcu i appreciate you for making us your first listen of the day every single day truly thank you for tuning in and keeping it going on this train we're at about 1100 subscribers we're trying to get that number up to about one 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 thousand two hundred and fifty that's what that's the goal we're setting now right let's get it to to 1250 by the end of the middle of next month all right let's let's our goal right we're trying to add about a buck 50 on here but let's talk about the backup quarterbacks and the performance that they were able to put on and it didn't there's not many games you're going to play four quarterbacks for reference professional football teams don't even carry four quarterbacks so this is a rarity that you're going to see this amount of quarterbacks played in a game and most times when you do you're losing you not only are you losing you lost but these guys these aggies they won this game pretty comfortably and i think the, the reason they were able to do that is because it was Bayshaw tootin show all along mind you you get down your first quarterback you're like ah oh, man you get to your second quarterback and he gets hurt now you get to your third quarterback and he gets hurt and you have to play the fourth quarter with your fourth string quarterback. You're probably feeling like, ah, man, this game ain't going to go too good for us. You have to play the majority of the game with your third string quarterback. This game probably is not going too good for us. However, the reason I believe that North Carolina a t was able to fight through the adversity is because the game plan didn't shift that much. Only the person who was taking snaps under center or in the shotgun changed. But the whole time, it was going to go through Bashaw Tootin. And that's why they were able to find such success. When I look at it, Tootin had 12 for 140 yards. He had a touchdown catch on basically a show. It was, it was, it was like a glorified handoff. But whatever, it counts on the, on the quarterback stats. He was a man. I look at what he did the two games before. It's hard for me to believe that they weren't going to count on him being the man. If South Carolina State wasn't able to stop Bashaw Tootin, then it didn't matter if it was Jalen Flower. It didn't matter if it was Zach Yeager. They were going to run the ball through 33. And that's exactly what they did. However, I will not discount the fact that it is still difficult to go through four quarterbacks in a game and find success, right? Because at a certain point, you would think that they know you're going to run the ball. But like I said, in that third quarter, where they were able to actually come out with the or come up with their best point production they actually did that with their third string quarterback they played pretty much the whole game with Jalen Flower so you don't expect to win a game playing four quarterbacks against a team that is your equal and it's not as if they were bad they played this game with four quarterbacks because they kept getting hurt it was injuries it was necessity that you get to your third string quarterback I don't think they came into the game expecting Jalen Fowler to you know play three and a half quarters I don't think they expected that, but they did, and it worked out. So, Jaeger got hurt on the slide. Um, Eli uh, Brick Handler, he came in, threw two passes, went out. Didn't see much of him on the day. So, now it's Jalen Fowler. And they even got to Young Hooker, right? Because the fourth-string quarterback, and we're going to talk about him in a second. But, actually, no, actually, we're going to talk about um, him now. I was actually impressed with what they did with Hooker because when you look at real 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 late in the game you're up 18 points or no you're up 11 points and now Austin Hooker is at your quarterback position it's third and 10 you've been running out the clock basically the whole time in the fourth quarter the fourth quarter was run out the clock from the minute the fourth quarter started and in third and 10 you throw a a shot medium down the field not quite deep 
But I was impressed with the fact that they trusted him to do that. Now, you might do that with your first string quarterback, maybe even your second string quarterback, because Brick Handler has played a bit of football this season. But your fourth string quarterback, the redshirt sophomore, he comes into the game and in a pivotal moment when you don't want the, the clock to, to stop, right? In most of these situations, you're either running the ball or you're throwing a very short, safe pass that you feel like is going to be completed and hope you can run for the yardage. This ball was thrown beyond the sticks. It was completed, and I felt that was a big-time throw, and it was a big-time move for Coach to even trust him to make that throw. Now let's get to Jalen Fowler because Jalen Fowler played the majority of the game, and I have three throws that I feel like really were the highlight of his performance, and every single one went to 88. Every single one went to 88. So let's get this with the timestamps as well. So you had the first throw that went to Caldwell, 88, right? So the first throw that went to Caldwell, it was 10 minutes and 20 seconds left in the third quarter, and it was a big-time throw. I was like, oh, for me, it was the first time in the game that Fowler made a throw that I just said, oh, okay, that's nice. That's nice. They're they really getting it going. Mind you, what I said, in the third quarter, let's read off the, the passing stats for each quarter-by-quarter quarter breakdown, right, for North Carolina a and They had three passing attempts for 12 yards in the first quarter, seven passing attempts for 39 yards in the second quarter. They had five um, passing attempts for 80 yards, and they also completed on four out of the five. It was their best completion percentage in any quarter as well in the third. And in the fourth, they had four for 24. Um, and overall, they were just running the ball out. But you look at that third quarter where they had five completions or five attempts for 80 yards. That's when they really were able to get the ball going. You combine all of these um, other numbers or excuse me, all these other yards in each quarter. You're looking at 39, 51, 75. So even if you combine all the other quarters together, it doesn't reach what that third quarter was able to do from an airing it out perspective. And that's the reason that you marry. You marry the second best offense or running performance in a quarter and the best passing performance in a quarter, and you get the most productive quarter offensively for North Carolina a and And I really appreciated these live stats because they really put it together really well. I was like, wow, I don't see this on most people. So shout out to a and for that. But overall, that was the first big throw right after there was a touchdown. You get to the second big throw, still to 88, still to Caldwell, eight minutes and 14 seconds left. You have another big throw. So I felt as if Fowler really settled into the game, and then he ended up rewarding Caldwell with a touchdown pass. And all of this came on Moultrie, the cornerback. So it was all on the left side of the ball. And I just felt as if this felt like a confidence-building performance in a game that was meaningful. And also at a position where you needed to get something together. I'm not saying that Fowler is going to be the starting quarterback. However, I will say that I think a look at Fowler becoming the starting quarterback should happen. You should definitely weigh that because for the first time, it felt like you were able to really get something going. And in that third quarter, right before he got hurt, it felt like, oh, he might be on the brink of something really well or really good. So I just think that's something to think about. If we're going to look at a quarterback controversy in North Carolina a and it's okay. We did it with Morgan State. Sometimes victories when quarterbacks come in and perform probably more admirably than you would think they would. Quarterback controversy. But I'd rather have a quarterback controversy than wonder who the heck my quarterback's going to be. And when you say it like that, you know it's not because I have all of these amazing options. No. I'm looking like who the heck my quarterback going to be because nobody I put in has worked. Fowler just did, especially in that third quarter before he got hurt. We have to look at that. But going forward, I want to give out the four defining moments of the game because I just feel like these were moments that either grasped what a team was trying to do or really changed how the game was going. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day, I truly do appreciate that. And I want to give the four defining moments of this game, North Carolina a and versus South Carolina State. I absolutely loved watching this game. This game was so much fun. Even though a and held the lead for the majority of the game, I never wanted to count out South Carolina State. I never wanted to say, oh, well, this is over, right? It, it, it reached a point when I was like, all right, if they don't do anything here, it is over. 
but it didn't happen so probably midway late in the fourth quarter when I really felt like all right this game is not going to go South Carolina State's way and you can even tell in the way that coach Buddy coached it at the very end he was like you know what we're just gonna live to fight another day no timeouts being called um just like all right this we're not gonna get back from this so let's not even have to go there so let's give these four defining moments four things that really painted how this how this game was going to go and the first one is the Jaeger slide the Jaeger slide in the first quarter where he had a three yard run he slid and got rocked helmet came off I think I think they might have thought it was targeting I don't think it ended up being targeting but it was still a late shot to a uh, sliding quarterback so when that happened you ain't see Jaeger again and that was the domino that that toppled it all you know so while Jaeger didn't lead to Brick Handler being hurt, was led to Fowler getting hurt, it did lead to all of these quarterbacks being in there. So I felt like this was a defining moment because it was the one that started it all. This was the moment that even though Fowler came out and performed well, we might not even have seen, I highly doubt we would have seen Fowler. So I just had to put that in there because that was the moment. The dominoes just kept falling, but this was the first domino. Now, the big play, the play I didn't want to allude to too early in the season. I mean, excuse me, too early in the episode. Now, that was the Bayshaw Tootin receiving touchdown. He did so much on the ground, and we gave him his flowers for what he was able to do on the ground in the first segment. So, I wanted to make sure that I did show love to that part of the game. However, you could have said the 38-yard touchdown run was a was a game-changing or defining moment. You could have said a lot of things that Bayshaw Tootin did were game defining however this right here was the most memorable and also in my opinion the most monumental and game changing we can talk about game defining and all of the other hoopla but game defining or game changing that was this this was the 15 yard shuttle pass pass where he just kind of caught the little dump off he broke out to the right put a nice cut to give himself some distance between the closest bulldog and then cut back up the hole and he was able to get in went up flying flipped over into the end zone landed and that was the last time that South Carolina State had the lead they were leading 7 to 13 at the time they came in because they missed an extra point so North Carolina A&T came in they scored they hit their extra point they're up 14 13 and they never looked back they never squandered that lead a matter of fact not only did they never squander the lead, which lead, which is why I think this was game changing and game defining, they also went on a 24 to nothing run at this point. So this quarter or this touchdown plus two more touchdowns and a field goal, which really stretched out the lead because at that point, now you went from having seven points to having 31 points. And South Carolina State never hit 31 points. They never hit that. So even if ANC never scored another point, they would have won that game. And this was what I really felt was the spark. Of all the plays, the one you can just look and point back to was that shovel pass. And it's ironic that as great as Tootin was on his on his legs, it was actually his hands that made the game-defining play and maybe the most monumental of them all. Now, South Carolina State's touchdown drives. I This is a defining moment because I wanted to paint something. This is all great about North Carolina A&T. It's phenomenal. You win, you you go through four quarterbacks to do it. Bayshaw Tootin is, is running that rock, 140 yards, only 12 carries. He had himself a receiving touchdown, three touchdowns total on the day. It's all great for the Aggies. Well, we got to say something other than B.J. Davis being really good about the Bulldogs. And I try to keep positivity in the air, right? I think that one thing they were really able to do well was pass the ball on their four touchdown drives. The only unfortunate part about it is that I had to add the caveat of saying they were able to do it well on their touchdown drives. Outside of those drives, they didn't do anything through the air. They really didn't do anything on offense, period. But we know they didn't do anything in the run game. That was the whole half of our first segment, right? They weren't able to do anything there. But they also weren't able to get things going on that uh, other than on that scoring drives that they had. So I felt as if the ball was coming out faster. I felt like they really enhanced the quick game. And you look at the stats, you know, Corey Fields had 300 yards. Um, he had four touchdowns. Shaq Davis had 127 yards. That's the, the, the quietest 100 point or 100 yard performance I've seen in a long time. He had it on six catches. But when you look at the stats, and it's not like they were just empty stats. 
you look at the stats and then you feel the impact when you're watching the game and they do not add up. They do not add up. And you would think that 127 yards from your star receiver would lead to more consistency, but you just didn't have it. Outside of those four touchdown drives, because when they got in the end zone or in the red zone, they did complete it. They did 100% know how to finish, but they just did not know how to start on a consistent basis. They only had two drives. If you take out the touchdowns, they only had two drives that went over 10 yards. That's a defensive dominant performance. But the reason that the touchdown drives were a game changing or not really game changing game defining point is because I think it pointed out what they need to do with their passing game. Let's do the quick throws the same way that coach said we were going to do it. You got Shaq Davis involved in them. Even on that first touchdown where you threw it about 20 yards down the field, you threw that pass in think two maybe two and a half seconds so it was quick triggers things were going fast and that's how you were able to find success as an offense that's what you need to continue doing and then lastly the game defining play is the game ceiling play and that was the first interception uh Tyquan King actually ended up picking that ball off however it was broken up by Jacob Roberts it's the linebacking duo that we highlighted in the beginning of the segment. It's the linebacking duo we highlighted to start off the matchups, the pivotal matchups on Friday's episode. I thought they were going to make plays in a running game, but Kendra Flowers was gone. It wasn't much of a contest with the other running backs. However, they did say, hey, I, I, I play all around. So Jacob Roberts was able to tip that ball to his linebacking compadre, Taekwon King, who also had 10 tackles on the day, continuing um his streak of being a tackling machine, he's had three double-digit tackling performances on the day. And then that, for me, was when it was sealed. There was no coming back. That stopped a time where North Carolina a and was not able to answer the second back-to-back -back touchdown drive for South Carolina State. The defense sealed or uh, came up stiff, and they also locked that down, had an interception. And from that point, well, there was no more momentum. All the momentum South Carolina State built was gone in an interception. They had an interception on the next drive that South Carolina State or a and was able to get a field goal on. However, that first interception to me took all the momentum, all the air from underneath the wings of the Bulldogs. Um, Bulldog fans, because this has been great about North Carolina a and I do want to say don't count out the Bulldogs because they were able to actually – bounce back last year after they got beat bad against florida a&m so we'll just leave it at that um but i appreciate you making us your first listen of the day every day bethune cookman knocked off grambling in a pretty good matchup on saturday but what does this mean for grambling as well we have a two-parter on tomorrow's episode including a breakdown of jada byers i think that's going to be our last segment so we got a full episode on tomorrow's episode but until then Make sure you're checking out the conference shows on the Locked On Podcast Network. And if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care. Stay blessed. Peace.